Hi everyone, I'm Amanda from Energy Tech Media for ETM and welcome to ETM Talks. Today we have a very special guest, Andrew Stokes from the Energy Systems Catapult in the UK with us. Andrew leads business development in the international team of the Energy System Catapult, um, linking UK innovation with overseas opportunities in areas like EV infrastructure, smart grids, and so on. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Amanda. We really enjoyed your talk at Dine and Discuss and how to support energy innovation. And we are really excited to talk to you more about this topic. So could you start maybe by briefly telling us more about the Energy Systems Catapult and your role? Absolutely, yeah. So, so the Energy Systems Catapult uh, is, there are nine catapult centers in the UK. We are one of those nine and they've all been set up by the government in areas that the government thinks is particularly important or particularly high potential for growth. Um, there are two of them that look at energy. There's ourselves, Energy Systems Catapult, and uh, one called the Offshore Renewables Catapult, which does obviously does you know, maritime and tidal and offshore wind and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're all independent of each other, but we all share some characteristics. So we're all not-for-profit centers. We're all set up to support innovation in our particular area. And we work with uh, the public sector, we work with academia, we work with private sector and um, yeah, we support, we, our role is really to help those people with new and exciting products and services scale them up and unleash innovation in those areas. And the energy systems capital particularly uh, is there to help us, let's say get to net zero, um, but grasp the economic opportunities that come with it. So it's take advantage of the clean growth opportunity. Um, so we broadly, I'd say, do two, two main kind of things. The first one is kind of big research, thought leadership, demonstration projects on the, the really tricky to decarbonize areas. And then the second one is uh, working, supporting directly, working directly with innovators and supporting them to scale up and come up with the new products and services we're going to need. And sometimes, obviously, these two work in parallel. And the idea is by doing these thought leadership, these big pieces will understand what the barriers to innovation are and will be able to enable some more of the, the scale up and the commercialization. And my role really is to do this internationally. So my role is to try and, um, in the international department, we try and link some of the UK innovators doing great things with overseas partners so they can you know, deploy overseas, but also collaborate overseas. They can do things together. We can learn from what's happening overseas. And at the same time, to try and set up these kind of bilateral or multilateral projects, looking at some of the, some of the really difficult things. So it could be, you know, uh, at the moment I'm leading a project in India that's looking at electric vehicles. And the project's in India, but it will teach us stuff for the UK as well. So that's essentially my role, yeah. That's really interesting. And speaking of electric vehicles, I'd like to know kind of, because when we talk about energy, it's a very broad topic. It includes many different things. So could you let us know, what do you mean when we talk about energy and energy innovation? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question, uh, because energy does mean lots of you know, kind of different things to different people. Uh, and one of the key um, things I I think we have to emphasize is that my, my organization is called the Energy Systems Catapult. And this basically means we try and look at the whole system. We try and take a holistic whole systems view. So all of the different energy vectors. So we're not just talking about electricity power. We also talk about heat. We also talk about transport, all of the different aspects of the system where energy is involved. And I think one of the, one of the key things as well at the Energy Systems Catapult is we, because we've got this holistic view, we try to take into account uh, we look at the commercial aspects, regulation aspects, policy. We also try and, you know, we think the consumer is front and center here in the energy transition. We're not going to, we know that EVs are coming, but EVs have to be something that consumers want for them to get on board with us. So we do lots of focus on the role of the consumer as well. Obviously, that's a lot of stuff. There's an awful lot going on there. So our core competences, our core focus 
Well, we look at all of these aspects. Our core things are really the kind of smart energy systems, flexibility space, uh, I'd say decarbonizing heat and uh, digital technologies, and also um, a little bit about kind of places, how you can decarbonize an area, a kind of a state or a campus or a larger district, that kind of, that's where we have more of our focus. We do do work in some of the other areas, but that's our core focus, I would say. I'm really glad that you mentioned holistic and that you guys are looking at multiple areas for the next question. Um, because I'd be really curious to know what would you say, you know, after looking at all these, or while looking at all these areas, what would you say are the largest challenges or gaps to reaching net zero emissions in the energy sector? And how do you think innovators are addressing these gaps? Yeah, so this is a, I think it's a kind of two layered question really in, um, I mean, there are, in terms of the biggest challenges, there are, some universal ones to universal across countries. So we know, for example, that, um, you know, the more renewable uh, generation we put on the electricity grid, we have to ensure that the grid can cope with the variable uh, output from that uh, and can, can balance effectively, ensure that it stays on, maintains a security of supply while still meeting all the needs and demands. So that's fairly universal. I think that's going to happen pretty much everywhere in the in the world. We also know that, for example, industry, decarbonizing heavy heavy industry, things like cement, steel, these kind of things are these are global challenges, aviation, maritime, and so on. But there are also location specific challenges. So we've done quite a lot of we've got quite lots of kind of modeling expertise in the national level uh, modeling tool that we've used to see like explore different pathways of how the UK could get to net zero. Um, and, you know, we, we crunched all the numbers, explore these different pathways, but one of the biggest challenges specifically for the UK, for example, is heat. So housing stock and our use, the use of gas for kind of hot water and heating and stuff accounts for some, something like 20% of the UK's carbon emissions. And for example, that's not such a big deal in Japan because it won't be a gas central heating based system. But in the UK, this is a huge challenge. You know, people have always used gas. It's something directly deals with their home comfort. We have an old housing stock that's old and drafty and these kind of things. How do we change that to a net zero system? So I think that's one of the biggest ones, um, one of the biggest challenges in the UK, for example, one of the trickiest ones. Um, in terms of how innovators are addressing gaps, I mean, it really looks at, you've got to look at examples of all of these different sectors, but um, I think if I wanted to pull out one thing, one trend that we see is really encouraging lots of new innovation, I'd say it's the use of data and digital technologies. Um, there's so much, and, you know, I mean, not necessarily using AI and machine learning, but there's so much more data now. There's so many more tools we have to use that, that we think that that can unlock lots of new innovation opportunities. And I think we can really see that in the innovation space. Obviously, the specific sectors, there's different things going on, but that's one overarching theme I think is really coming through. Now, I'm really glad you brought up both heating and data because I think heating is maybe something that a lot of people don't think about when we talk, talk about energy. We talk about electricity, we talk about electric vehicles, about heating, cooling, industry energy, all are really, really important and have a lot of emissions, like you mentioned. And also the use of data science and just digital innovation in general. Mm -hmm. I feel like for the general public, for example, if you're a coder, if you're a software engineer, the energy industry needs you. So if you're listening <laughs> and you're interested in energy, please do, um, you know, check out how, how you can use There's opportunities, yeah. <laughs> so many opportunities. And utilities need, like, more people with these skills because it wasn't a, initially a very digitalized industry. But now, now that's definitely necessary. But this will need, I think, a lot of, help to remove barriers to innovation in the energy industry. And I, I think this is something that the Energy System Catapult is focused on, you know, removing barriers to innovation in the energy sector in the UK. 
So if you could share a bit about how this has been done and what would you say are some key learnings from how, of like how to reduce barriers to innovation? I'd be really curious to hear. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, I mean, I can it's probably just best to use some examples. So one of the pieces of work we've been doing is we've been chairing what's called the Electric Vehicle Energy Task Force in the UK, which is uh, kind of looking at what the energy system needs to do to ensure that it's not holding back the electric vehicle transition. Um, and this is a really big, this is a really big task force. It's drawn on, you know, lots of different representatives from, from the sector. Um, and this has come up with uh, a number of recommendations for kind of policy and initiatives that are needed to support the sector, for example. I mean, one of the biggest ones that the Catapult has done, and I already mentioned the heating, is uh, we worked, we, uh, we've done a lot of work for the government in the UK of, of looking at how we can decarbonize the, the heating sector, how the domestic heating sector, what can we do there to decarbonize that? Um, and we've done, you know, that involved lots of research, but it also involved lots of trials with actual homes. We've got, you know, something like 100 homes where we trial different things with people. We tested things out with people. Um, and it's through doing these kind of real life tests that you start to understand what some of the barriers are. I'd say some of the key learnings, for example, in that case, um, are, you know, I mean, first of all, the consumer absolutely has to be along for the ride. You're talking about people's homes, people's comfort. If they are to turn to low carbon heating alternatives, it's so much easier if they want to. You know, we, we don't want to make this a mandatory thing that opens up a huge can of worms. It, it needs to be something they want to do. So that's, we need to consider the consumer. And historically, the consumer hasn't necessarily been considered as much as they should have in the energy system. Um, we also, I think, need opportunities to test innovation in a kind of, in as, let's say, as least risky a way as possible, because that's the only way you're going to really see if things work. It's a, it's a, a big undertaking to test some new energy systems technologies. If you can do that in a relatively risk-free environment, that really helps. And again, the kind of data can be crucial because working on with these homes on the decarbonization of heat challenges, the availability of data that we're getting from our trials and from testing these different things, we can see could potentially enable new solutions. So I think, you know, there's lots of learnings depending on the sector, but I think for the decarbonization of heat one, you know, the opportunity to de to test some innovations, keeping the consumer actively involved, giving them something they want, and having a making use of the data to inform the solutions and so on are absolutely key. Yeah, I think decarbonizing heat and you know any any sector is of course not is, is our issues all around the world. Mm. So I'm wondering kind of the learnings you got from the UK, um, based on the learnings you got from the UK and what's happening in the UK, what opportunities and even bridges do you think there are for innovators in the UK to innovate more with you know, innovators in other countries and for collab cross cross country collaboration? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, I mean, lots of the challenges I, I think are universal. You know, where everybody around the world is going to have to deal with integrating variable renewables, pretty much everybody's going to have to deal with the electric vehicle transition, this kind of thing. So I think if you're a UK firm, for example, with a really good technology in that space, which can manage that flexibility efficiently, there will be opportunities for you worldwide. Likewise, if you're a Japanese firm or if you're another firm, there will be opportunities for you worldwide. And Decarbonization globally is such a big challenge. The more we can share learning, collaborate, uh, the better, right? It's going to save us a huge amount of time and money. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities for innovators to work uh, bilaterally, internationally, look for opportunities to collaborate with partners overseas, work overseas, and ultimately it will be for the benefit of all of us. Um, I think they do kind of need a bit of support along the way, obviously, because some of these innovators might be quite small. 
and with resource constraints and all of this kind of stuff, especially in the current context as well of the pandemic and so on. Um, so I think things like international accelerators, international networks, these things all help linking people together. I think they're great. Um, one thing we've done at the in the, at the catapult is we engaged a lot with industry and they told us just getting visibility of overseas opportunities and actually kind of handheld so hand holding them to support them to link them to most opportunities are really important so we've set up something called the energy launchpad international which you know we've we picked a couple of challenged countries so india and thailand we've invited people to bid and we're giving them a kind of hand-to-hand -hand support to link them to people to uh, like-minded organizations or collaborators in country so i think things like that that cross these provide those bridges as you say create those links are really valuable to help the innovators uh, make progress with a different country yeah i think that's kind of why part what part of the reasons why we set up energy tech meetup as well because people need Absolutely. to network and, and link both in the same country, but of course also with other countries. Um, so I think maybe that's a, a, a synergy we have as well. Part of the solution, yeah. <laughs> but I think the energy sector is such a huge, I don't know, elephant to tackle. Is, is that a saying? It's such a huge thing to tackle. And I feel like there's a lot of challenges for startups, especially in terms of funding and, and just, you know, even pinpointing a, a, a a niche that they could actually tackle where there aren't already big players tackling. So if you could elaborate a bit on what do you think are the biggest challenges for energy innovators today? And maybe if, if we have time, how you think we can, they might be able to overcome them. So, oh yeah, oof, again, a, a, really, a really tricky one, but um, I think to, Obviously, there are specific sectors, sector specific challenges, but I, just to say a few words on the kind of the big picture, um, some of the challenges for energy in, uh, innovators. I think, first of all, so naturally, it, it is a conservative sector. Um, historically, a lot of the focus has just been on securing supply, so keeping the lights on. And then, you know, if you think about it, against the context of keeping the lights on, if you have somebody with a new exciting product that might be great, it's quite a risk to suddenly try and use something like that. Um, if, if you're, so if, you know, so the, the need for testing, the need for exam case studies and to try things in, as I said, as kind of uh, least, least so if you can de-risk that testing, that, uh, that process, at all, I think that's really going to help if you can make that as risk free as possible so that innovators have the chance to trial things in a small but controlled real world environment. I think that's really that's really valuable because they're not going to get headway unless they've tested it, but it's very hard to test on the full system, right? So you've got to, that's, that I think is a key challenge. Um, I also think, um, just the complexity of the system that you know everything is inter interconnected uh you can have lots of different one aspect can have that impact elsewhere you've got to it's very it's just a very complex system it's not for example it's not you know it's not a the, the whole energy influences every aspect of our lives so there's so many things we need to think about and they're all interconnected. So that makes it very difficult for innovators as well. And I still think that there is, I mean, there are some very strong established players in the energy sector who maybe have been doing things for a long time. Some of them are changing now, but some of them aren't necessarily. But there's still also a little bit of a mindset out there, I think, that some people still think green is expensive and do, decarbonizing, decarbonizing is expensive. And that's a bit of a mindset that I think is still there with some people, which is going to thwart, you know, which is going to prevent them from trying new innovative things. And I don't necessarily think that's true anymore. I mean, there's lots of examples of now if in research and studies have shown that, you know, that if firms pivot towards a kind of sustainable business model, it can increase their productivity. There's lots of examples of, for example, in the UK, we've managed to grow our GDP while at the same time decrease increasing the amount of renewable electricity generation. 
So I, do, I think we've got to shake this screen is expensive thing. I think that's that's for the past, but some people I think still cling on to that. So, sorry, that was a bit of a, a broad answer that went in lots of different directions, but there's just a few thoughts. Oh, well, it was a very broad, it was a very broad question. So thank you for that. I'm sorry, that's that's actually all the time we have for today. Um, Andrew, do you have any final words? Uh, I mean, just uh, just a, I guess a, just a small call to arms, really. It's um, it's a huge challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us all. Um, we do need to have consumers along for the ride. We're not going to get there if we don't. And if you meet somebody who's pessimistic and says we're never going to keep temperature global temperature below the temperature rise below two degrees or something like this, you've got people who are fatalistic and given up a little bit. They've lost the point, you know, if we can't keep it beneath two degrees, it's much better to keep it at 2.1 degrees than three degrees, right? It's a, there's a scale. We've got to do what we can. We aim for 1.5. If we can't do that, it's still better to, to come closer than to give up. And some people out there, I think, tend towards being a bit fatalistic about this. So let's encourage them. We, we've got to do what we can. Uh, that's a very, very wise final words. And, you know, if you come closer, then the finish line won't feel so far away as well. Exactly. So step by step thing. Well, thank you again, Andrew, and to all of you who checked out this video. Remember to, to, to subscribe for more interesting insights on energy innovation from around the world. And like the video if you enjoyed it. You can also follow Energy Tech Media on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Plus YouTube um, with the links below. And to get info on our events and activities, you can also um, find us on Facebook. So see you soon. And thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.